Hare Krishna, dear devotees, please accept our humble obeisances. All glories to Jagat Guru Shri Prabhupada, all glories to Guru Dev, all glories to Samud Vaishnava Vaishnavi devotees, and all glories to His Holiness Chandra Muli Swami Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, dear devotees, we are very uh, fortunate we have His Holiness Chandra Muli Maharaj with us today, who will be speaking to us from the Srimad Bhagavatam. And so we encourage devotees to be quite attentive and hopefully and surely we're going to get some of our doubts cleared at the end of the Krishna Katha. So again, thank you Maharaj uh, for being here uh, to the Hare Krishna Africa platform. And without further ado, we may put the verse on the screen and you take it over from here Maharaj. Okay, thank you my basis. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Tasmadidam Bhagavatam Puranam Dasalaksanam Soktam Bhagavata Praha Srita Putraya Bhuta Krit Translation Thereupon, the supplementary Vedic literature Srimad Bhagavatam, which was described by the Personality of Godhead, and which contains ten characteristics, were told with satisfaction by the father, Brahma, to his son, Narada. Purport. Although the Srimad Bhagavatam was spoken in four, four verses, it has ten characteristics, which will be explained in the next chapter. In the four verses, it is first said that the Lord existed before the creation, and thus the beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam includes the Vedanta aphorism, Janmadhyasya. Janmadhyasya is the beginning, yet the four verses in which it is said that the Lord is the root of everything that be, beginning from the creation up to the supreme abode of the Lord, Naturally, explain, naturally explains the ten characteristics. One should not misunderstand by wrong interpretation that the Lord spoke only four verses and that therefore all the rest of the 17,994 verses are useless. The ten characteristics, as will be explained in the next chapter, require so many verses just to explain them properly. <clears throat> Brahmaji also had advised Narada previously that he should expand the idea that he had heard from Brahmaji. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu instructed this to Rupa Goswami in a nutshell, but the disciple Rupa Goswami expanded this very elaborately, and the same subject was further expanded by Jiva Goswami, and even further by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. We are trying to follow in the footsteps of all these authorities, so Srimad Bhagavatam is not like ordinary fiction or mundane literature. It is unlimited in strength, and however one may expand it according to one's own ability. Bhagavatam still cannot be finished by such expansion. Srimad Bhagavatam being the sound representation of the Lord is simultaneously explained in four verses and in four billion verses all the same. And as much as the Lord is smaller than the atom and bigger than the unlimited sky, such is the potency of Srimad Bhagavatam. Omagyan timirandasya ginajana salakaya chaksun militam yena tasmai Shri Gadave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste 
Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvase Sasunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Panchakalpa Tarubis Cha Tripa Sindhu Veva Cha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnava Bhyo Namahona Maha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadat Har Sivasati Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. From this verse in purport, we're getting a little bit of the unlimited nature of Srimad Bhagavatam. Actually, if you take the actual definition of Bhagavatam, it means the glories of the Supreme Lord and the glories of of the pure devotees who are engaged in service of the Supreme Lord. Therefore, as it says here, we can, it can be explained in four verses or it can be explained in four billion verses. So Bhagavatam is unlimited, yet the essence of its explanation is uh, described in these four verses, which are called the nutshell verses, which come up in the next chapter, I believe. I think it was actually in this chapter, from verses 33 to 36, that these four verses are mentioned in chapter 9. Um, and then, of course, there are 10 essential subject matters, which are fundamental and can be expanded into other subtopics based on these 10 fundamental subject matters. And that's listed in the first verse in the next chapter, chapter number 10, they list the 10 topics. And the essence of all topics is called asraya, which means that Sri Krishna is the supreme shelter of all knowledge and all spiritual activity. Everything is directed to knowing him and developing a eternal loving relationship with him through the process of devotional service, which is nicely explained in the Srimad Bhagavatam in very simple and but in very extensive uh, a philosophical explanations. The so Bhagavatam is unlimited. Srila Jiva Goswami, in his Sandarvas, he wrote the uh, different Sandarvas. There are six major Sandarvas. And he mentions that in the, in the heavenly planets, they have an understanding of Bhagavatam to be one billion verses. Here we have 18,000 verses, but each one is complete in itself. Just like sometimes we mention that in Matura, Krishna's uh, activities are perfect. In Dwarka, they're most more perfect, and in Vrindavan, they're most perfect. So the word perfect is all in there in all three categories. But then there is more and more information. That means that one can be fully self-realized in any essential uh, aspect of this. In other words, if you can understand even one verse of Srimad Bhagavatam completely, you can become fully self-realized. So Bhagavatam is like that. It can be understood in a very small amount of verses or it can be expanded unlimitedly and be understood in that way. The so knowledge is unlimited. Um, transcendental knowledge is not simply limited to, to what you read. As you, when you read, you think about what you read and then if you keep reading it, the same thing over and over again, Naturally, if you're reading with trying to understand, you'll get more and more meaning from the same points you read over and over again. 
So this knowledge is what is called uh, dynamic as opposed to material knowledge, which is limited. Uh, dynamic means that there's no limit to anything. Srila Prabhupada was speaking to one of his uh, disciples. I think it was Shruti Kirti, who was his personal servant. And Prabhupada was talking about nectar devotion. Of course, nectar devotion is the handbook for the science of execution of the process of devotional service. And Prabhupada was saying, if you, if you, if you can just uh, understand one page of nectar devotion, you can be fully Krishna conscious. And then he went on to say, no, not one page, but one paragraph. Then he went on to say one sentence, and he had to say simply by one word. So it sounds a little bit hard to believe that even a little bit of knowledge of this great scripture is enough to bring one to the perfectional platform. But this is the power of this knowledge. It's not limited in any sense of the word. For instance, we have the example of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. When he was preaching on the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, Jamad Yasya Yataha, which is mentioned here in this purport, uh, he spoke on that same verse for three months in in Bangladesh, in a place called Dhaka, every day, and without covering the same material each day, expanded that verse into more and more explanations. So here's an example of a self-realized soul when they approach this knowledge, they can they can see and understand that each each word, each sentence has unlimited meanings. For instance, we have the example of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He uh, was speaking about one verse in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, which is called the Atmarama verse. I believe it's in the seven, 11th chapter of the Bhagavatam, the first canto. In that verse, um, the Acharyas give about 11 different meanings of that verse. But Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in his discussion with Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, he gave 64 meanings of that same verse. And after explaining 64 meanings, he said, I, I simply began. I haven't even touched the essence of the, everything yet. So this is an example. You can read those explanations of those 64 meanings in Chaitanya Charitamrita, where, the, where Lord Chaitanya is speaking to Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. So, therefore, to make a lifetime study out of Bhagavatam is really the, the greatest achievement one can perform. Because Bhagavatam is, as it's explained in the very beginning of Bhagavatam, when Krishna left the planet, he left himself in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam. So it is described that Bhagavatam is the literary incarnation of the Supreme Lord, transcendental sound in the form of uh, written material about the glories, pastimes, activities, names, qualities, forms of the Supreme Lord. But Bhagavatam is considered to be the best of all or the highest of all religious scriptures because in it, everything is there. Uh, many religious scriptures deal with some of the activities in the material world, such as pious activities, performing beneficial activities for people in the material world, such as you know, opening hospitals, feeding the poor, clothing the needy, uh, doing welfare work in different ways. Uh, that's considered to be material. And you find in some religious scriptures, and many, that these principles are also mentioned. And then there is also um, 
how one should engage in practical activity in order to maintain oneself. And that is called karma, or what is needed to maintain the body and soul. But that's not so, that's not discussed in Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam is free from these uh, lesser principles, and it deals only with pure devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And that can be easily understood as you read and study Bhagavatam. So in our society, as a spiritual movement, there are so many uh, courses available for a systematic study of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Each year in Sri Mayapur, starting in October and going all the way up to March, there is systematic study of Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, Nectar of Instructions, uh, and these are the main scriptures that are given in a systematic study way. And I was just reading today that this year during the summer, they're going to give uh, systematic studies on the first and second cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam. Also, I believe, coming out of Mayapur. So, yeah, there is much knowledge to be understood and transcendental knowledge, as Krishna describes, will frees one from the entanglement of material life. To know how this material energy works, to know one's relationship with the material energy, to know one's relationship with the Supreme Lord, to know one's relationship with the spiritual master, to know one's relationship with the with living entities who are on different levels of existence. This is called sambandham. Sambandham means relationship. And it's the first principle in the study of transcendental knowledge. And all of this is nicely described in Srimad Bhagavatam, along with the next step, which is called uh, Abhideya. Abhideya means the activity that's performed in relationship to the Supreme Lord. And that means devotional service, the science of bhakti. And then the goal, which is called prayojana, is to de develop or awaken one's natural love for the Supreme Lord. All of this is described nicely in Srimad Bhagavatam. So it's highly recommended by Srila Prabhupada and others that we should very carefully read and study this scripture. It's a, it's a lifetime when Srila Prabhupada was on a morning walk with one German professor, Professor Durkheim. Prabhupada got into a very uh, lively discussion with the professor. The professor was, was quite intelligent and Prabhupada really picked up on his intelligence and they really got into discussing. And at one point Prabhupada started to discuss Bhagavatam. And as he was saying, he says, there's 18,000 verses in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And each verse will take you about one month to understand. So that was Prabhupada's statement. And then he asked his devotees to do some calculations. How long was that? 18,000 verses, one month each. And the answer was that's 1,500 years. So Prabhupada made, wanted to make a point. This, we have so much transcendental knowledge available just in that one scripture that it will take lifetimes just to, to understand it. But as Bhagavatam is mentioned here in this purport, that even if you understand a small part of it, you can be fully self-realized. And the 10 subjects will be mentioned in the first verse of the 10th chapter coming, coming up. And, and it's very systematically explained in according to the different cantos. Of course, it's not perfectly systematic, but in the very beginning, of Bhagavatam in the first and second canon, 
you get the creation and the subcreation. Uh, the creation is what Krishna does, and the subcreation is what Brahma does. <laughs> Here in the second canto, we're hearing a little bit about Brahma's role in bringing about the creation. That's called the subcreation. So this is a very detailed, <laughs> very interesting. And that's why Srila Prabhupada established every day in our temples all around the world, uh, Bhagavatam classes. So devotees would get an insight into this transcendental knowledge. Mm -hmm. And when Srila Prabhupada was asked prior to his departure from the world, they asked him just before he was leaving, uh, how will we be able to associate with you when you are gone, when you leave us? Prabhupada said, I'm in my books. You read my books. You can associate me with me directly. My purports are my ecstasies and devotion to Krishna. And when Prabhupada sometimes he would uh, take the opportunity to gather the devotees together, usually in the evening, where he, wherever he was in the world. And he would pick up his books and start reading them to the devotees. And sometimes he would, even when he would be reading Krishna book, which is a summary study of Bhagavatam, he, uh, the tenth canto of says Bhagavatam, Prabhupada would sometimes laugh and uh, the devotees would be a little curious Prabhupada's reading his own books and laughing. And they would, Prabhupada would say, these are not my words, these are Krishna's words. He's speaking and I am simply writing. So Prabhupada was a channel or a medium by which to bring transcendental knowledge into the world in the form of these books. And out of all of the aspects of what Prabhupada gave us in terms of the process of devotional service, his books remain one of the most, probably even if not the most important activity in devotional service. He said, read these books, understand these books, distribute these books. Everything you want to know is in these books and more especially Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the king. It's called Amalam Purana. Amalam means pure. There's no no artha, karma, dharma, and moksha in these, these Puranas. It's pure devotion to Krishna. And if we systematically and very carefully read this book, these books, we can become fully Krishna conscious simply by reading just like we hear the Maharaj Pariksit, he heard from Sukadeva Goswami for, for uh, in seven days. And Sukadeva Goswami delineated the entire Bhagavatam, beginning from the first canto all the way through. And by the time that he had reached the 12th canto, you can see, uh, Sukadev Goswami, or actually Maharaj Pariksit says, yes, now I'm completely free from all fear. I'm ready. I I'm in full knowledge of my, my understanding of the Supreme Lord and my relationship with him. And he was ready to, to meet his destiny, which was, he was cursed to be bitten by a a poisonous snake in the form of a bird uh, and then, you know, leave his body. So that eventually happened, but he had no fear, not even the slightest, and this was due to, to being fixed in transcendental knowledge. Transcendental knowledge can bring one's consciousness to the platform. Uh, just like we hear, we're not this body, that means whatever happens to the body is not happening to you. You're, you are separate from the body, although you're in the body. And you may also get some experience of what happens to the body, 
but it's not happening to you. It's just because we identify ourselves with the body and we are connected with the body in that way. But the soul, us, is never never touches the material energy at all. Although it's just like a car. You're inside of the car. You're driving the car. And apparently what happens to the car while you're driving is happening to you in one sense. But in actuality, it's not because you are different from the car. So we're different from this material body. And to have that knowledge and also to be able to relate that knowledge when we are in different situations of life helps us to become free from the suffering of the material energy. Uh, so all this knowledge is, is there in Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, it's therefore, it's the best of all scriptures. Okay, so these are some points we can speak about in Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, let's see. What else can we talk about in relationship to Bhagavatam? Um, that the pastimes of the Lord are also very much uh, infused within the pages of Bhagavatam, the different incarnations of the Lord, the Lord Nishringadev, Lord Vamanadev, Matsya Avatar, and some of the Lord Rishabdev, uh, all of these different incarnations of the Lord Varaha Dev, they're all part of the Bhagavatam. And so the Bhagavatam gives us a direct connection with the qualities of the Lord along with his pastimes. And by hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, uh, one becomes free from envy. One becomes uh, what we say, uh, fixed in one's position as a spiritual being, free from any material designation that one may be connected with. So Bhagavatam is, has so many amazing benefits when we read it. Not only the knowledge that is given, but the effects that knowledge has. Because it's... It is delivered in transcendental sound, although it's written in, on a piece of paper, it comes in the form of a, uh, literary knowledge. Still, it has effects in such a way that one becomes fearless, one becomes non-envious, one becomes, this is simply by reading it, what to speak of understanding it. Uh, so there are many, many characteristics that devotees develop and there are many, many qualities that devotees get rid of that are not needed simply by hearing or reading Bhagavatam. That's why in the second chapter of the first canto, it says, Nasta prayeshu abhadreshu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati uttama sloke bhakti bhagavati naistaki. By a regular attendance on the Bhagavatam, and by service to the pure devotee, all that is auspicious, inauspicious, all that is inauspicious within the heart is practically destroyed and loving service to the transcendent Lord is established as an irrevocable fact. That's a very powerful verse spoken by Sutta Goswami. And Srila Prabhupada quoted that verse very often just to illustrate the importance of devotion to the Supreme Lord in the form of Bhagavatam. Because Bhagavatam and the pure devotee are one sense non-different. Because the pure devotee lives on behalf, lives by the teachings of Bhagavatam and preaches the teachings of the Bhagavatam. So when we hear from the pure devotee, we are getting the words of the Bhagavatam. So when we read it, it's the same thing. We're simply getting it either through the direct relationship with the Bhagavatam through the understanding of the pure devotee, or we're getting it directly from the pure devotee himself who realizes the knowledge of Srimad Bhagavatam. 
So this is a great opportunity to purify. And the knowledge is joyful. By reading Bhagavatam, you actually can feel transcendental happiness as you, uh, the stories, the uh, qualities of the pure devotees, the characteristics, the amazing activities of the Supreme Lord all bring about a sense of happiness and joyfulness and great interest in the hearts of the one who reads these this knowledge regularly. Well, this is, what can we say about Bhagavatam that is uh, that actually will glorify Bhagavatam? You can't really say because Bhagavatam is Krishna in sound vibration. So, um, and of course, to study it is really the best way to get the essence of it. By reading, you get you get some knowledge. Reading leads to understanding. Understanding leads to uh, application of the knowledge. Application leads to realization. Realization leads to one developing transcendental qualities, skills, abilities in their execution of devotional service. So it's very progressive how the effects of Bhagavatam elevates one higher and higher to the platform of pure devotional service. Okay. We can, maybe we can open it up for questions. Well, Hare Krishna, thank you so much, Maharaj, for such beautiful discussion on Tishrimad Bhagavatam. Uh, dear devotees, if anyone may have questions, realizations, comments that you would want to ask, please, you may do so by using the hand emoji or your physical hand, and you'll be asked to unmute to speak. And if possible, you may turn on your cameras so Maharaj may see your beautiful faces. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> Hare Krishna Mata Sri Devi. Uh, Ma Maharaj, I have one quick question. Um, you were talking about the nature of the soul, that the soul can never be moistened, it can never be touched by any material thing, which is something we've read from the scriptures. But some few months ago, I learned, I didn't know until that time, some few months ago, that the analogy given in the Bhagavad Gita about the soul, the nature of the soul with uh, like uh, somebody in a chariot. So you have a horse, you have the reins, and you have the charioteer. And it turns out that the, the driver of this body in which the soul is occupying is the intelligence. Right. And, and this intelligence is very mundane. Most of us, our intelligence is not spiritual. And if you have a mundane intelligence guiding the soul, it's just like having a drunk driver driving you in a nice car. So. What is the fate of the soul when the soul has such a very disturbed intelligence being the driver? How safe are we in this material body as atmos, as souls? Well, we're being led by this, what we say mundane or material intelligence to the sense objects in this material world. And therefore the body mind and the intelligence is getting entangled material activities and the soul although it's not uh, uh, connected with any of it it identifies itself mistakenly with what's happening on the material level and therefore there is this false it's it's like suffering in the dream when you suffer in a dream it seems to be very real, 
but actually it's a dream. You, someone says you're being chased by a tiger, but there's no real tiger. But while you're in the dream, you're fear, you're feeling fearful of being eaten by the tiger. So the whole idea is to come back to our natural content, wake up from our material uh, identification with this material world, and develop our consciousness in Krishna consciousness or engage in devotional service. So until the soul is actually developed, led by proper intelligence or spiritual intelligence, it will be dragged in different ways. When it's led by spiritual intelligence, it finds its relationship with the, with the Supreme Lord or with devotional service. Otherwise, it's like a bad dream. That's all. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Maharaj. So I I believe by daily hearing and studying the scriptures, uh, this intelligence will be helped and get polished uh, so that the, the soul can really function as it is constitutionally designed to, that is to render devotional service to Sri Guru and Krishna. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, we we'll go to Jagdish and Badra, please. You may unmute. Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, all obeisances. I've got a questions uh, regarding Maharaj Prakshit. At the end, he was burned by the a snake bird. Why was he uh, killed in such a way? Why was, didn't he have a, like a better death? No, he was cursed to die in that way. He was cursed by a Brahmin boy. As when after that curse came, he accepted it, and he gave up his position as a king, and renounced everything of his material life, and sat down on the banks of the holy river Ganges, sometimes Jamuna, and simply heard from Sukadev Goswami for seven full days and became fully self-realized. So he was destined, and he accepted that curse, knowing that he would be uh, dying in seven days, or his body would be finished in seven days. So, yeah, you can read about that in the Srimad Bhagavatam. That's where we are in our daily discussion in our, in our regular class every day. We're on that same point where Sukadev, uh, when Maharaj Pariksit will be cursed by this Brahmin boy. So yeah, it's in the 18th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto. So did he know he was going to die? He was going to burn to death? Yeah, he knew. Can, can I ask you another question? Yeah. Uh, you said you joined the movement in 1973. And uh, you were born in a Christian uh, background. Why didn't you become like a, a priest, a Christian priest? Why did you join Hare Rama Hare Krishna? <laughs> You're asking me why I chose Krishna consciousness? Yes. Because all the questions that I couldn't get answered anywhere in other experiences, I found answered in, in, in Prabhupada's books. Mm. Everything is there. <laughs> and, and and sorry, can I ask you another? What did your parents think at the time? Because in the in the late sixties and early seventies, uh, it was a new thing that was coming to America, and people were thinking. Well, the people had their own ideas about it. Well, it's very nice you're talking about me, but let's talk about Bhagavatam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, okay. You can ask me those questions at another time. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Jagdish Badra, uh, for your questions, and thank you so much, Maharaj, for the answers. Uh, uh, Maharaj, there is a question in the chat room. It says, uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, may I humbly ask, uh, have I read it wrong that the brown, uh, the Brahmin boy was actually Kali. I think she's uh, she's referring to 
the Brahmin boy who encouraged uh, Maharaj Parikshit to die in seven days. Well, Kali was was chastised by Maharaj Parikshit, and he had no play. He had no way to spread his uh, mission destruction. So Maharaj Parikshit allowed him to live in the kingdom, but he had no influence anywhere because there was no illicit sex, intoxication, meeting, and gambling. There was no place for him. So Kali was looking for a way in, and he found his way in through this Brahmin boy. And that's that's mentioned. And when Shringi was, he was a Brahmana. So the, the beginning of Kali Yuga is really the misuse of Brahminical power by those who had Brahminical power. And if you take that even farther, uh, the whole the whole downfall of the in the Indian culture is the downfall of the Brahminical class. So Shringi was the way in for Kali to spread his poison. And that was that unfair cursing of this great king by this Brahmin boy who had power. I mean, Maharaj Parikshit also had the, had the power to counteract the curse, but he didn't. He accepted it as the Lord's arrangement for him. But that's mentioned. And that's in the 18th chapter of the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for the beautiful uh, response. Maharaj, I have a, I have a question from uh, the purport to today's class. Uh, if I may put it back on the screen, uh, Shapapad said something uh, I would humbly want you to explain a little more. And I've highlighted it here. Uh, Shafopad is making a reference to the great Srimad Bhagavatam. And Shafopad is saying that it is unlimited in strength and however one may expand it according to one's own ability, Bhagavatam still cannot be finished by such expansion. Now, uh, we know Shafopad uh, Shapopat's edition of the Bhagavad Gita is carefully titled Bhagavad Gita as it is, because there have been many unscrupulous people who have also given commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, but they were not qualified. So if, if anyone can expand on the Shemad Bhagavatam, we understand that it still cannot be uh, finished, but I'm not sure if I saw Shrapopat uh, expressing who is qualified to expand on the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. But Shrapopat was saying that according to one's own ability. So if someone's ability is not up to the level of pure consciousness and he explains it, how, how dangerous that is. Well, he's talking about within the context of devotional service. Only those, okay. who, only those engaged in devotional service can actually expand it. Those who are not engaged in devotional service, even though they may try to expand it, it's not Bhagavatam, it's something else. Mm -hmm. It's just their own... Uh, misconceptions, their own interpretations. It's like Bhakti Siddhanta says, you know, uh, that licking the outside of the honey bottle, I can't get in the honey bottle, I can't taste the honey, nor can they distribute the honey. So yeah. there are people who will comment on Bhagavatam, on every, everything, they'll comment on Lord Chaitanya, his life, everything. But if they're not devotees and not engaged in devotional service, then their commentaries are just superficial, useless, sophistry, half-truth. 
Thank you, Marek. Uh, Mother Sid Ashley Devi, please, you may unmute. Thank you. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Prabhupada and <clears throat> my humble obeisances to all the devotees. Uh, speaking of Srimad Bhagavatam, we hear how important it is to read it, study it, uh, understand it, apply it, and so on. But uh, as we attend the morning Bhagavatam class every morning, I find for myself that uh, passive listening to the class, it becomes like a routine. Yes, I attended Srimad Bhagavatam class. I heard something. How much of it has really gone into my head is uh, questionable. And so I would like to know how to make it more effective my attending the Bhagavatam class. What should I do? How should I prepare myself so that I get the most out of the Bhagavatam class? Well, mm, um, let's see. There is a verse, the first canto, third chapter, verse number, the last chair, the last verse in that. Can you bring that up? Uh, Okay, marriage. One one three forty four, I think it is. It's either one three forty four or one three forty three. Let's try forty four first. I think that's where it is. One three forty four. Forty four. Which is yeah. in the purport. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, that's First canto, third chapter. Okay, let me do it this way. First canto, third chapter. Because this is a very important statement and it answers the question perfectly. Yes, you go there. Yeah, that's where you find it. So go down to the very last verse in the chapter. Mm -hmm. You can go down the page here. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me see here. It's all about Bhagavatam here. Okay, here. Right here where it says, I did that that's the real process of receiving Bhagavatam. Let me see, this process of, uh, okay. okay, keep going down. One should hear with raptation from the real person. Okay. So start with here. That is the real process and start to highlight there and that, yeah, and then go down. Okay. So I'll read it. That is the real process of receiving. One should hear with rapt attention from the real person. And then he can at once realize the presence of Lord Krishna in every page. The secret of knowing Bhagavatam is mentioned here. No one can give rapt attention who is not pure in mind. No one can be pure in mind who is not pure in action. No one can be pure in action who is not pure in eating, sleeping, fearing, and mating. So here, these are the these are the characteristics. Of, but somehow or other, if one hears with rapt attention from the right person, at the very beginning, one can assuredly see Lord Sri Krishna in person in the pages of Bhagavatam. So here it is, that one has to be one has to organize their material activities in such a way that they don't interfere with their spiritual consciousness. So it's here, rapt attention, that means complete attention, absorbed attention, but you can't do it if your mind is not pure. And so how do you get pure mind? But no one can be pure mind who is not pure in eating, Sleeping, fearing, and mate. So it has to be regulated carefully. But Prabhupada said, after he says all that, then he says, just try to hear. 
So your ability to absorb what is being given to you is the quality of your, your understanding of the material. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Your question. Yeah, thank uh, Mela Sri Devi. Uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful question. And it's very interesting how Sri Prabhupada uh, has said many times that I've given you everything in the books, just just study the books. And it's amazing how Maharaj you referenced this wonderful answer to the Sri Devi's beautiful question. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> Um, dear devotees, uh, does anyone have any question uh, before Maharaj leaves today? Uh, let me see, I think there is a question here. Oh, okay. Maharaj, there is a question in the chat room. Uh, the question is, what does it mean to be pure in fearing? Mm -hmm. That is uh, the purport we just read from uh, the Shrimad Bhagavatam. Being in fearing. Yeah, fearing. So sometimes the word defending is used. In this case, the word fearing is used. They're pretty much synonymous, interused interchangeably. Mm -hmm. But the word in this case, there is uh, what is what is the, what is the fear of a devotee? Uh, a devotee fears that to be connect, captured by to be allured by the material energy. So that's called a healthy fear. Ralpa talks about that too. Healthy fear of the material energy or Maya. So. I'm not afraid. I'm I'm fearless. A person will say, who, who practices Krishna consciousness successfully becomes fearless, because they know nothing can happen without the arrangement of the Lord. Therefore, they're protected by the Lord. And if something does happen, they understood it can only be happened because the Lord is allowing it to happen. So they have no fear because they have they're completely protected by their all powerful. Supreme Personality of Godhead. But a devotee does have a fear, oh, I shouldn't act and think or do something that will cause me to get caught again into the material energy and fall from my position in spiritual life. So that's called the healthy fear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This there of Maya is very yeah. wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maharaj. And uh, thank you, Sakshi, uh, for the beautiful question. And that's uh, the, the reason that's so, that's very important because devotees don't fear Maya enough. And that's why we're always trapped by Maya. Yeah. <laughs> because we don't have enough fear for Maya. Yeah. We, we take Maya as just being, you know, just part of life. <laughs> so... To execute devotional service, as Prabhupada said, it's like shaving with a razor. If you're shaving with a razor, you have to be very attentive. Otherwise, there could be a slip. And so we have to be always very attentive to, in, in everything we do. So not to act or think or move in the wrong way and to always be focused on what is Krishna consciousness. It's a moment by moment uh, uh, focus on keeping ourselves connected to the spiritual process in thought and word and activity. Well, uh, let me see here. Yeah. Okay, uh, Maharaj, there is one more question in the chat room. And uh, the question goes like this. Uh, all glories to Shri Prabhupada, all glories to you. Uh, I wanted to know if someone shares everything with someone, it is considered a Vaishnava offense. 
if someone shares uh, everything with another person, is that considered a Vaishnava friends? If one does what with another person? If someone shares everything with someone, I don't understand what the writer means by sharing everything with someone else. I don't know if the writer can expand on what he meant. If you tell everybody, tell every to someone everything about yourself, is that an offense? Is that what it means? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's not very clearly stated. I don't know, uh, Manish, I don't know if you are in a position to speak, then you may give a little bit more explanation to what you say or asking. Because the, what, what uh, it's written here, it says, I, want, I wanted to know if someone shares everything with someone, is it considered a Vaishnava offense? Well, you don't want to make another person your, their, your garbage dump. If you have a lot of some garbage in your, in your life and you don't want to dump it on somebody, <laughs> that could be if somewhat offensive. <laughs> If if you're sharing of some with something about your, you know, problems, your negativity or whatever you yeah, I think that's something we usually don't do. <laughs> sharing or communicating with other Vaishnavas should always be uh, very pleasant, truthful, to the point, beneficial. Not that we take out the garbage every time we meet somebody. <laughs> well, uh, Arikishna, thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Bhakta Hassan, please you may unmute and go ahead to speak. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Mahamur is great overseas. All glory to Shrapapad and all glory to you and all glory to the Assembly devotees. Thank you for wonderful class, Guru Maharaj. Uh, Guru Maharaj, please, my question is, um, if uh, for some accidentally you have, or some residents you have a, a Bhagavad Gita, which is not as it is from someone else, and you, you get to know that in ISKCON, what you have to read is uh, Bhagavad Gita as it is. So in this case, this Gita, what do you have to do with it? Uh, if, for instance, it's not good for you to use it, can you give it to somebody else? Or, or how, how can you get rid of that, that book? <laughs> this is my question, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Just take it and dig a hole in the in the in the backyard and put it in. <laughs> <laughs> it's paper, and so it will break down and merge within the soil again. So you're not destroying it; you're just transforming it. Uh, okay, so you can you can <laughs> just plant it in your backyard. Or someplace in a clean, <laughs> in a clean spot, though not so. Not so Hare Krishna Maharaj, please. I didn't, I didn't hear you well because of that. Okay, yeah. Maharaj was saying find a very nice, neat place somewhere around your backyard and then bury it there. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, thank you so much, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Govinda Prabhu. Yes. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Please accept my respectful obeisances. All glories to you and all glories to your service to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to the Vaishnava devotees. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, uh, please, this question was raised yesterday. But I would like to get more clarification from you. 
see that when we have something very precious, we try to protect it. We try not to lose it. And devotional service is so precious. And to perform austerities is not an easy thing to denounce things that you like most uh, with the aim of getting something better. And so we try to chant, we try to uh, fast, we try to do so many things so that we may become purified at the end. And so we don't want to do anything that will uh, destroy our advancement uh, uh, in our attempt to advance in our Krishna consciousness. But we know one thing that uh, blaspheming of devotees is the most dangerous thing that can, that can clear out our credit, our um, advancement in our Krishna consciousness. But it is also said that that devotional service, when it is being performed, the, the reaction to that, to those actions are permanent. May Krishna never forget whatever devotee does uh, for his pleasure. And again, we also say that there is a mad elephant offense that when the mad elephant enter into, into a garden, he destroys everything. He does not leave anything. So how do we understand what Krishna says that when the service is performed to him, the results of that is permanent. And at the same time, we say that the mad elephant offense can destroy it one devotional creeper. Well, these mad elephant offense, blaspheming and Will will stop one's progress in devotional service, may even cause one to fall. But whatever devotional service that the person has done prior to that, previous to that, remains. So in due course of time, if they somehow or other rectify themselves, then they pick up where they left off when they fell down, they don't have to start from the very beginning again. These offenses knock you out and can cause you to be away from devotional service, even for a whole lifetime. But somehow, if you get some good fortune, rectify your offenses and come back, then you start from where you left off. You don't uh, have to start again from the beginning. So that happens just like sometimes we don't finish in this life. We may become 50% Krishna conscious. You know? Next life, we start with 50%. <laughs> um, so yeah, wherever you, whatever you gain is never lost. And that's an absolute principle. Can, it cannot be changed. But you can be, you can stop your devotional service and uh, postpone it for, you know, as long as you stay uh, entangled in the material energy. But as soon as you try to come back, then you can pick up from where you left off. Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. Uh, my my understanding to your explanation is that. When the uh, offense is performed, uh, the offense will stop one's progress. Right. It's like try to try to um, work on a particular um, path, and you get to the point where the path is blocked or dead end. Right. So the service put uh, the offenses put one to the dead end of his devotion, so he cannot progress further. Right. But now. Is, then there, where is the question of the mad elephant or friend destroying the creeper? If the creeper is not there, so how does it get destroyed? Well, it means that it, it's, it's the same. It's the same explanation. The uh, the creeper is no longer. It's in other words, whatever you've done in the past. Uh, 
it, it's it's a, it, you're stopped in progress. You're not in whatever you've done previously, even if it's even if it's a little bit, is never lost, no matter what happens after that. Doesn't mean it's doesn't mean whatever you've done is gone. No. Any devotional service is not within the realm of the three modes of material nature. Therefore, it's like money in the bank. Somehow, if you lose your bank account book and you forget who you are and you forget you how much money you have, this money still stays in the bank. It's there to you somehow or other connect with it again. So in that sense, it's lost because you're not aware of it or you're in another consciousness. But previous activities are never destroyed. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Maharaj. They just put on hold. Is... They just put on hold. Mm. Yeah, in this law endeavor, there's no loss of demonition. Yeah. Uh, Jagdish. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Govinda Prabhu. Uh, Jagdish Bhatra, please you may unmute. I have, yes. Can I ask my question? Yes, please go ahead. Hello, Maharaj. Another question. The Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the most important verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam? Well, there is called Paribhasa Sutra. Paribhasa Sutra is the verse which de describes the essence of the Bhagavatam. Um, sometimes the scripture will have more than one Paribhasa Sutra. But from my experience and discussion with others, and it's mentioned also by the Acharyas, the Paribhasa Sutra is 1328. First Canto, third chapter, verse number 28. Sahadev, go ahead and bring that one up. 1328. Ete chum sam kalam pum sam krishnas tu bhagavan swayam indriya vakvakalam lokam rideyanti yuge yuge. All the above mentioned incarnations are either plenary portions or portions of the plenary portion, but Lord Sri Krishna is the original personality of Godhead. All of them, referring to the previous incarnations, appear on planets whenever there's disturbance created by the atheist. The Lord can incarnates to protect the theist. That is that is mentioned in discussion by I think Jiva Goswami also as being the Paribhasa Sutra or that that verse which describes the essence of Srimad Bhagavatam. That Lord Sri Krishna is the original personality of Godhead. <laughs> Now, you can also go to the last verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam, and you may also see that as one of the most important verses. Mm. That's 1, 1, 12, 20, no, 1, I'm sorry, not 1, 12, uh, 12, Canto, what is it? 13th chapter, I think verse number was the last last chapter in the 12th canto. Yes, uh, it's chapter 13. One, 12, 13, 23, I think is the last verse. That, that sums up the Bhagavatam, that verse. Nama Sankirtan Yasya Sarva Papa Parasana Prana no Dukha Samasta Tandamami Hari Param. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the Lord, the Supreme Lord Hari, the congregational chanting of whose holy name destroys all sinful act actions, and the offering of obeisances unto one who relieves all material suffering. So that sums up everything in Bhagavatam right there. Mm -hmm. the, the chanting of the holy name really is the is the essence of all spiritual activities. 
But the Paribhasa Sutra is 1328. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, especially for yeah, Go ahead, Maharaj. That establishes the whole purpose of Bhagavatam one three twenty eight. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for such uh, detailed and loving explanation to the beautiful questions. Uh, Mother Shri Devi, please you may unmute. Thank you, Sadhguru. Um, Maharaj, when we are performing the daily activities of devotional service, such as rising early, attending Manglati, chanting our rounds, uh, attending the various arati ceremonies, uh, attending Srimad Bhagavatam class, doing seva, etc., that is our daily schedule of any devotee. Is it that simply by performing all these devotional activities with as much devotional um, you know heart that one can muster slowly slowly one will get purified and uh, we may not see quantum leaps in advancing in krishna consciousness but we should patiently continue with this process or we should not be satisfied uh, with just uh, performing these activities we should actively seek to make advancement yeah, you should be actively seeking to make advancement. It's called focusing on developing perfection in devotional service. And that means you have to understand how to execute devotional service, what to avoid, and what to accept. <laughs> you don't know what to avoid, you're going to fall into, you're going to be like you're sitting on a boat and you're rowing the boat, but the anchor is stuck in the ground. <laughs> you're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> if you don't know what to avoid, even though you are, you know what to do, your your progress is very slow, if any. So, but we should be able to want to perfect. If you want to read uh, something that really illustrates this point. It's quite lengthy, and that's Shiva Ram or Shiva Ram Swami's book called Sankalpa Kumudi. He takes this principle of Eka, what is it called? Eka Brata, focusing on perfection in the execution of devotional service. Just like I want to perfect my chanting. So every time I'm, I sit down with my the holy name, I'm working on perfecting that chanting. I'm using all of the intelligence, ability, and the information that I have to put quality uh, into, into my chanting. So that is, yeah, that is actively trying to make progress. <laughs> Full absorption in the mood of perfection. Thank you, Guru Well, thank you so much, um, Maharaj. Um, anyone else with something else before Maharaj leaves? Thank you for the beautiful questions. And uh, well, uh, I know some devotees have been asking how they will be able to access this recording. And uh, there is a link shared in the chat room, which uh, you can access. There is a YouTube link uh, for the Hare Krishna Africa platform. And when you go there, you'll find the recording. Yeah, Sabadeva, I have a question for you. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, this is off the topic, but maybe you can help. There's one, there's a program coming up in France in the first week of August. It's a glorification of Bhakti Tirtha Swami. And yes. Three of the Bhakti Tirtha Swami sannyasis, Charadeshnu, um, Vasudev, and I forget the other one. Dear Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj. Yeah, and myself, four of us are coming, and it's now, the, the, the devotee who is organizer is Dhruva Maharaj in London. He's trying to find a database 
of disciples of Bhakti Tirtha Swami. And so far, he's not been able, not able to find anyone who has that database. And I referred him to Ekaviriya and, uh, you know, Rajalila, Parijata, and he said they don't have it. So if you know anyone who has a database on Bhakti Tirtha Swami's disciples, um, and then maybe you can connect with Dhruva Maharaj. I can give you his connection in London. Yeah, I think I, I, do, I do have his contact, Dhruva Maharaj. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, uh, as far as I remember, we used to, we used to have a database of all the disciples of Gurudev. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to work on it to see, but I remember we used to have it. Okay. It, it, it was started by our mother Indrani. Oh, yeah. She's yes. no longer with us, right? Yes, no longer with us. Maybe Madhvacharya might have it. I don't know. Or, or Kunti, maybe. Yeah, I, I'll try to get in touch with a couple of devotees. Uh, I'm sure they, they, they still will be there in the system. I think it's still there. But we'll check to see. Yeah, I know it exists. It's yes. Like it. it does. It does. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you. This is a very beautiful engagement. <laughs> it's a nice service. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> uh, Amada Shri Devi, please you may unmute. We got Ma we got Madhuvan there. He wants to speak. Oh yeah, uh, Madhuvan. Okay, then we'll come to Madashri Devi. Madhuvan, Prabhu, please you may unmute. Hare Krishna Maharaj. All glory, all grace on your left of peace. Thank you for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to speak with you. Um, just my worry is uh, the situation whereby it appears as if that the personality of Kali defeated uh, Maharaj Parishi. Um, from Sigma Bhagavatam explains that um, Maharaj Parishi is a very compassionate, kind person. And then, so when the personality of Kali now petition him that he should give him permission to reside in places, so he gave him four places, such as gambling, drinking, prostitution, animal slaughter. And then the sixth place, which is uh, where there is gold. So uh, it was explained that when uh, when he gave, now given the place where there is gold, then there was a problem because King Parishi himself was carrying a gold crown on his head. So does it mean that as a devotee, we have to avoid gold? Or, or... That's just my concern. The devotees have to avoid what in particular? Oh. Do, oh. Should devotees avoid anything in relationship with gold? Because that is one of the places uh -huh. Maharaj Parishit allowed Kali to dwell. Yeah, the hoarding of gold, it says. The hoarding of gold. But it's it's not like devotees go out looking for gold mines. It's not, it's not a, a program. I mean... If you have a gold chain, if you have a gold watch, I mean, it's not, that's not a problem. <laughs> that's fine. But I don't think we go out hunting for gold, <laughs> trying to hoard gold. Like there are people who do that. They yeah. try to collect as much gold as they can in any form it comes in. Yeah. Yeah. But if you have some possessions that are gold, Keep them. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the answer, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. uh, so we go to Mother Shri Devi, please. Just one last quick question. Guru Maharaj, on this point of offenses that uh, Govinda Dev Prabhu asked this question to you, that uh, we'll get blocked and uh, we will not be able to make progress until we you know, pick up the process again properly after rectifying ourselves. Does that include 
going back to those people whom we have offended and offering obeisances and begging their forgiveness, or that is not uh, required. We should just become sincere and correct the tendency we had to make those offenses and carry on. Well, if there's fences knowingly and unknowingly. So when you make fences unknowingly, what can you do? You can pray. You can ask forgiveness. Devotees also do that. You can also go to, uh, there's a place in Mayapur called, uh, what's the name of that place? It's the ashram of Devananda Pandit where you can go there and uh, ask forgiveness for all Vaishnava Aparad. And by just by going to that one place, it's, it's called a place called Koladweep, one of the nine islands in Mayapur. You can get free from your offenses. That's the, but if you know who you offended or how you offended, then it's, then it's mandatory that you make proper amends by apologizing for the offense, asking forgiveness, and be willing to offer some service to the person that was that you offended. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because this Devananda uh, himself committed that offense and was pardoned. Right. Yes. Yeah. He offended. He offended uh, Sri Bhaskar. Yes. Yeah. Uh, then, I really love that story. And then he really pleased Lord Chaitanya by serving Vakreshwar Pandit very nicely. Yes. So the Lord, because he served a devotee very nicely, the Lord gave him freedom from that offense. Yeah. And his fence to Srivas was somewhat due to ignorance, not as a purposeful offense. He failed to restrict his disciples who offended Srivas. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for the answers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the word is, if anyone has something before Maharaj leaves, otherwise, I think it's time, Maharaj, we, we give Maharaj some break. <laughs> <laughs> Maharaj, we can thank you now for being here with us. And at least we cannot, we cannot touch your divine body physically, but just having your darshan virtually is also so blissful thank so, you i hope i get to see you sometime in in america yes you're going yes. to america this year or are you going to gita nagri <laughs> yes thank you so much mara yes um mara may i ask you one last question yeah, of course <laughs> yes uh there was this time in Gita Nagri when uh, we were there with Great His Holiness Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj, and you know sometimes we play some sort of games, and lots of questions were written on a piece of paper, rolled up and put in a basket, and then you dip your hand in whatever you picked, you you read it out, and then you answer or you let you demonstrate it or whatever. So there was one question I picked. And the question was what when when was there a time that you doubted your guru? And that was a very big question. And my answer was that that has never happened. And my Guru Dev said, no, that cannot be true, Sahade, because only pure devotees can say that. And so 
I, I know that I'm not a pure devotee, so I knew that there must have been at least one point in time that I doubted my guru. But at that material moment, I didn't recall. So later on, I was thinking about it, and I remembered a time when I doubted my guru. Um, because my guru had mentioned that a very good friend of mine he was an Indian. He was into spiritual things. And Guru Dev didn't know him physically, but he said he drinks alcohol. And I doubted my Guru Dev saying that he drinks alcohol. But it turned out that it's true that this person drinks alcohol. Later on, I got to know. So the reason I'm, I'm narrating this story is sometimes I, I begin to doubt how Sri Prabhupada has given us this assurance that if we follow the four regulative principles, we chant our 16 rounds, we'll go back home. When, when I look back at great, great personalities and great, great penances they performed, I still couldn't go back home. It, it took them much longer. And I also understand that I'm not supposed to doubt Sri Prabhupada. But sometimes I begin to wonder whether following these things will actually take me back home because I'm trying as much as, excuse me, as much as I possibly can to go back home in this lifetime. So Maharaj, if you may help me with this, uh, I, I sometimes get. <laughs> I think you have to ask Prabhupada about that one. <laughs> but uh, the way I understood it, I've heard it also. That means from the time you began your initiation to the time you leave your body, there was never a time you didn't chant your rounds and, and there was never a time you broke the four regulative principles. That's the way I understand it. It doesn't mean like, well, I'm doing it and I'm not doing it for a while and then I'm doing it again. No, no it's not that. That doesn't work. <laughs> well, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank you so much. But uh, I mean, this demonstrates how merciful Sri Prabhupada is to all of us. Uh, Sri Prabhupada is so merciful. And uh, we yeah. pray that we can we can take shelter at the slaughter's feet eternally, no matter what the situation. Hare Krishna. Yeah, that's that's the main point. You got it. Yeah. Look look, look who's on look who's asking a question. Oh, oh, oh. Hare Chakra Prabhu. <laughs> Hare Chakra Prabhu, please if you me. I think for your sake, my right will hold <laughs> on <up> living <laughs> for now. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, today's class, uh, the questions and the answers, they are like uh, tornado. <laughs> they are staring everything. Thank you. Uh, Maharaja, my question is about the question mother, uh, what is the name? She Devi. Yes. Asks uh, about when you are performing your devotional service, do you have to be thinking about uh, making advancement. Yeah. Yeah, and we understand that when Krishna was instructing Arjun, Krishna was telling Arjun, just do your duty. The, don't be worried about the re results of your actions. As long as you are following my instructions, just do your duty. So, in the process of performing our devotional life, do, do, do we have to just focus on just doing our duties sincerely from my heart? We have, and to, not... we have to understand the context. Arjuna, okay. Arjuna didn't even want to do his duty. Mm. So by saying that, he was just getting him to do his duty. That's all. Okay. Absorbed in devotional service, 
and are, who are want to make more, they want to really fine tune their devotional service, should try to perfect their activities in devotional service. Arjuna is a different case. In, in that particular situation, he was finding reasons not to do his duty. And Krishna okay. was bringing him back to the point of doing duty. But in general, when those who are absorbed in devotional service, we should be thinking, how can I fine tune and make it even better? Focus on the quality like that. The devotee thinks like that. I'm chanting my rounds, but I want to chant my rounds better. What do I have to do? So let me work on it. Hare Krishna, thanks so much. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. So, uh, dear devotees, we're going to humbly and respectfully uh, request you all to kindly unmute. And we all chant the loudest Hare Krishna Maha Mantra on top of our lungs to express our appreciation to our revered speaker, His Holiness Chandra Mali Swami Maharaj, please. Jai. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Rama, Hare 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 Yes. Thank you very much for today's class. Hare Krishna. Thank you all. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.